Hello, I'm Tracy Meller, an architect and partner at Rogers Sturt Carver and Partners, and also a member of the Reba Awards Group. I'd like to welcome you today to the Building Stories Talk. This is a new series where we celebrate Reba Award winning buildings and invite their architects to share their experiences, as we can all learn so much from seeing the innovation, careful thought and hard work that goes into these projects of whatever their scale. And today, I'm delighted to be joined by Cindy Walters from Walters & Cohen Architects and from Carol Patterson from OMA. who will be telling us about their award-winning work in the education sector, including the International College at King's School Canterbury by Walters & Cohen, and then followed by the School of Science and Sport at Brighton College. Please do send in your questions during the talks in the chat and we'll have a Q&A at the end. So let's get started with Walter and Cohen's project for an international college at the King's School Canterbury. The brief was to provide standalone teaching and living facilities for 80 international students and staff at King's, King's School Canterbury. But the building also forms part of a master plan undertaken by Walters and Cohen, which includes the previous refurbishment of a disused garage as a fencing centre and a theatre building by Tim Ronald's architects. So over to you, Cindy. Thanks, Tracy. Thanks very much. Um, hello, everybody. And um, I'm going to talk to you for about, I'll keep it to 15 minutes now because we've, uh, we've, we've started a little bit late. But I'm going to talk to you about a project, this project you can see in front of you, um, which is, um, is very close to our hearts. Uh, this is designed for the King School Canterbury, one of our clients who, this is the, I think we're on to project number seven. And um, this is on a, uh, the, the malt house that you can see in the background was very skillfully converted by Tim Ronalds into a theatre and also some accommodation for the International College. And both of these projects won RIBA National Awards uh, last year, which is wonderful. Um, so I'll, I'll just start off by, oh, I can't move my, oh yes, I can. Um, so um, you can see we, we had a fantastic team, um, uh, uh, people in our office, our client um, is at the bottom right, um, upper ladder, uh, the wonderful Mark Taylor, uh, who's commissioned all these projects. But we also worked uh, very closely with Fanshawe on the costs, with Price and Myers on the structure, Skelly and Cooch on the environmental services, Bradley Holschunach on the landscape, Hobbs Parker on planning, um, and uh, the contractor was our Dirtnall and Sons, who are the oldest were, were the oldest contractor in the country, starting, I think they started their company in, in the late 1500s. Um, so you can see there, that's a, 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 an aerial photograph of the, of the Canterbury Cathedral precincts, and the, the areas in red are all the projects that we've been involved in. Um, I just snuck in a slide here, which is uh, our latest project that we're doing for them, which is inside the cathedral precincts. And you can just see, I took those photographs on the right of the flint and stone work that's uh, on site at the moment, which is uh, it's just a joy to see really, just um, such incredible craftsmanship. We're only allowed to use two materials in the cathedral precincts, um, limestone and, and flint, and those are, and the, the, the roof is clay tile. But anyway, oh, back to the, to the International College. So you can see here, you can see where the, I hope you can see my cursor, but you can see the blue um, area um, where my cursor is highlights the Malthouse site. All the bits in yellow are, are the areas occupied by the King's School within the cathedral precincts. And the, the images on the right are the Malthouse as it was originally. And the area, that, then the red line of the site is dotted um, in, in the bottom right image. Um, so we had this very industrial context to start with. Um, we, we, there, these are some of the existing buildings on the site. Uh, the the Maltas had been really quite badly um, messed about with, but there were also little sheds and garages and some cottages. So we had quite a big task to decide what to keep and what to get rid of. The, the Maltas, there's that aerial photograph you can see, it was a car repair yard. Um, and the and the malt house itself had been, as I said, was part of the, the factory um, facilities on the site. So we were we did a, we started off by doing a master plan for the site as a whole, um, and we ended up uh, adding some staff accommodation, some parking, uh, a beautiful sort of plaza that links the two uh, buildings together. Our international college 
uh, where on, on, on the right and the malt house on the, on the top left and this black building is was the one of the car garages that was retained um, and converted into a fencing center you can see some outdoor sports facilities um, and generally we just increased the amount of green area on the site um, so there's a lot more trees there's a lot more greenery there was a lot uh, a lot more feeling of of open space but there's a railway line uh, that runs into Canterbury um, right along the edge of our site and we were very aware of the well we were inspired by and aware of the industrial kind of beginnings of the site um, and for those of you who know Canterbury you'll know that the cathedral precincts are a very specific um, uh, have a very specific quality and character and we were very conscious of the fact that we needed to create a new precinct um, outside of uh, the main precincts for uh, for the for, for use by the school. This was also an, a new venture for the school. Um, these were students coming into mainly 14 to 17 year olds coming in, coming from other countries um, to improve their English. Um, and so this was the, this was a, a sort of self-contained school with boarding accommodation and teaching facilities um, uh, spread across the site. But these students also go and use the sports facilities, the, the music facilities, and all the other facilities of the King's School. And when they're ready, they move into the main King's School or, or they go on to other schools. Um, so we had to create a, a sort of home from home, um, and a, an environment that was suitable for, um, for these students to, a sort of self-contained environment for them uh, where they could live and learn. So that was just the site plan, and you can see that was the existing site plan, the two big garages and the malt house and the retained cottages. And this is what we ended up with, which was um, the, 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 um, the, the courtyard uh, configuration for the main, for the, the international college. And that we always wanted, we always used to you know, do this when we were talking about the project, which was to create this safe, secure, home from home environment. I mean, there's a there's a lot of precedent for courtyard typologies in, in residential academic environments. But this felt even more pertinent because of the age of the children and because they were coming from from a long way away. So that that courtyard typology translated into a very, very simple building uh, with four staircases in, in the four corners, an entrance leading you through into this courtyard garden all the teaching um, and sort of common room accommodation arranged around the, the ground floor. This is actually the lowest level of the house master's house. And there is some office accommodation here, uh, an office for the house master. But this was predominantly the main common room that you can see as you come in. Uh, and then the, the, the classrooms arranged around a single loaded corridor. Um, one of the sort of, so just anecdotally, one of the our challenges in the brief was to one of the governors asked us, what would you do if this building doesn't work? What would you do if, if, if you know, this international college idea is a, is a failure? And um, we, we, we might want to convert it into a conference center. We might want to use it as a, as a small hotel. Um, so we had to kind of bear that in mind when we were designing uh, the building. Um, so at moving up the building then, you get this single loaded corridor looking back into the central courtyard double rooms, so two students in a room with an ensuite bathroom, and then some other accommodation around. Um, and um, it's, it, the, 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 it's very important that there is staff accommodation on each floor that, you know, that, that where the staff have direct access to the students, that it was all, or the students have direct access to the staff, more importantly. But it was also very important that you could see across this courtyard and you could see, you know, people walking to their rooms at night. And there was a just general sense of community. The, the sort of more obvious typology for a residential building is to do a double loaded corridor. Um, and we very much wanted to avoid that. It didn't fit on the site apart from anything else, but we wanted um, this sense that all the rooms got their views and their light from the outside. And they and when you were circulating at the upper floors, you looked into um, the, the courtyard. And then the top floor is, oh, well, sorry, the, the top floor is, is the same as, as the first floor. And then we started to think about the materiality of this building and thought long and hard about the, um, 
the, the industrial past and how we could build uh, a, a very robust building um, in to, that would work in this context. Um, we chose two main external materials, uh, precast concrete and Corten steel, or British weathering steel, as it's known. Um, and we wanted the roof. We were we were very, it was very important to us that the roof and the walls could wrap up and over as one material. But, you know, that that's that's easy to say and easy to show on a sketch or a diagram. It's not so easy to, to make work in reality. And one of the things you have to work out is where's the rainwater going? So one of the very first things we did was work out how that gutter detail would work between the roof and the wall so that you could actually make that, keep that continuous material wrapping up and over. There's also another little gutter running along the bottom here so that the, the water from the court in steel wouldn't run down and stain the, the precast concrete panels. We were working, uh, I'm just gonna show you some context elevations here where, or sec, sort of sections where you can see the relationship between the Malthouse building and this new building, uh, this new courtyard topology with the roof wrapping up and over. And the, 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 we, we had a lot of discussion with the planners and with Historic England um, and with the client about the, the, the scale of this building, that it shouldn't dominate the Malthouse, and that it sh but it should take its cue from the Malthouse. Um, the, we were on a, working on a, an incredibly tight program. Um, we, we wanted to make sure that everything, as much of this building as possible, could be made off-site. So we, the, the idea of the precast panels, the idea of the, um, the core 10 steel that comes in cassettes, is that, was that everything could be made, and, and most of the structure, a lot of the structure is, is CLT. The idea was that it could all be made um, off-site and brought onto site and assembled very quickly. So this concrete, these concrete panels were made by a manufacturer called Cornish Concrete. They were, um, we did a lot of samples on site, but they did, they did a fantastic job. The only problem is that they, their works is down a very narrow lane and um, they got snowed in for a couple of weeks, which caused us a few problems on site. Um, you can see the, the construction methodology there. The ground floor is a, a, a concrete table uh, with the, the uh, precast concrete panels uh, forming the, the lowest level. And then the upper two floors and the roof are a CLT structure. And again, the idea of that was that it could be clipped into place uh, and put up very, very quickly. And it was actually put up very, very quickly. So that was, the, um, that, that was our thinking. Um, as it happened, the contractor ran into some financial difficulties and, and all of our efforts that had gone into, into speeding up the program um, didn't, uh, didn't well, ended up being fairly pointless, but that was the, that was the design methodology and the idea. And then we started adding the core ten or the British weathering steel panels. Um, and there was a there was a rather kind of scary time when we were going to site before the steel had actually weathered properly. When it was very, it was quite quite core ten steel is 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 a beautiful, beautiful material. And as any of you who've ever used it will know, it weathers very quickly and it, it evens out into this magnificent color. And we made, you know, we were quite careful to always make sure we photographed it with a bright blue sky too. So you get that fantastic contrast, but it's quite easy. It, you know, you can imagine a, a, a nervous client who's never used this material before when they see it in this in the form of the, the slide on the right, they, they were, they were, everyone was holding their breath and waiting for the steel to weather. And then I'm just going to finish. I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to show you some images that we showed the client on the left and what we ended up with on the right. So, you know, we, when, you know we're working with a very big community when we design these buildings. There are, there's the entire school community. There's the entire community who live around the, the site. Um, there's all the people we have to consult with through planning. Um, there are governors um, and trustees and, and a huge big group of people. So when we when we are designing, we have to show the images on the left to show them what to show people what they're going to get. And we always try and make this as accurate as possible. I think in, in that image, I'm very happy to say I think the finished building is more interesting and exciting than the CGI. And then we go around, we go through the project explaining how these spaces are going to work and how they're going to support the living and learning. So there's there's common rooms, and you know, we we work very closely with the school to choose all the furniture and design spaces where students can 
can you know live and, and socialize together. Uh, and this common room, actually, in retrospect, if we could have we could have made it three times the size, and it would have been it, it would have still been in use constantly. It's it's an incredibly popular space. The teaching spaces were very carefully considered in terms of lighting and acoustics and views out. And what's absolutely amazing about this building is you can stand in that central courtyard and you can see all the way out to the surrounding gardens through the teaching spaces, which is, is joyful. And everybody who lives there really loves that. The bedrooms, there was a lot of thought that went into the bedrooms. You know, um, the students do not study in their bedrooms. Their bedrooms are just a place to relax and sleep. Um, they come out of their, their bedrooms to study, um, which is, was, is, is a lovely um, aspect of this project. But every room has two very big windows. Um, every room has plenty of storage. We went for timber on the floors. Any of you who've worked in residential accommodation for students will know that you know the go-to solution is to put carpet on the floors. We, we, we worked quite hard on that, and, they were, and the, 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 the client were delighted with the end, um, the end result. Um, and there's a niche, you know, where the students' heads are on their pillows, where they can plug in their phones or their iPads or put their book or their cup of tea. All these little details are what, you know, what really made it feel like home and why the students love living there. And then we go around to the building and, um, you know, the, these are the, the common areas at the ground floor opening onto the courtyard, breakout spaces, social spaces, Places where you can come out of a classroom um, and break out into a small group or just sit with a cup of tea and look out into the courtyard. Um, and that's the courtyard. It's, it's, uh, the gardens have grown up beautifully now and it's looking absolutely amazing. And I'll, I'll finish on that slide, which is where I suppose it all comes together. This animated ground floor that's very public, the gardens, the the base, which is glazed and open and transparent, and then the more solid upper floors uh, where people live, uh, which are defined by the, the, the Cortain steel. Um, and I just wanted to say one last thing about, about working with a client when you have been working with them for so many years and you, we, you develop a relationship of, of trust um, and you, know, you carry on doing project after project and they become patrons, um, and you know this is a very is a very special thing in in our world, and 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 we're very fortunate to be able to work with clients like this. And it's joyful for them when they win awards uh, because it reinforces the importance of them as as clients. So they were they've been thrilled with all the awards that the project has won. So hopefully I haven't run over, and um, I'll uh, I'll see you later. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Cindy. Wow. Oh, what a wonderful client to have had the opportunity to build that relationship with. I think we probably all give our right arm for that kind of uh, opportunity. Um, and what a fabulous transformation to a seemingly quite unassuming site, um, which is, you know, turned into not only a, a new building, but really a, a new place. And I think that's when you look at the before and afters, that's very striking. I love the simplicity of the sort of courtyard design. And as I think we all know, simplicity is actually incredibly hard to achieve. And the single-sided corridors just loved it so much more quality to those spaces than would have been had it been a double-loaded corridor. I think one of the things that strikes me before we go on to the, the questions in the chat is that the materials, I mean, they are utterly beautiful, but they are a striking choice. And I can imagine that, as you say, it was quite difficult with the client because when you were trying to sell them corten and concrete to materials that could be perceived to be really quite cold, but actually they have a real warmth and they're so beautifully detailed and it gives a lovely nod to the industrial history. So my first question is, how on earth did you convince the client to go with corten and concrete? You talked about their sort of shock when you proposed it, but how did you move from that to them agreeing it? Um, it, it well, it, we looked at a number of options um, and discussed that with them. Um, and we were looking for a, 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 a material that reflected the red brick of the Victorian malt house. And as you say, you know, the history of the, the industrial history of the site and the railway line. Um, and we were quite sure that we want, so we wanted something that wasn't brick. It wasn't adding another huge brick building onto the site, but it was, it was, it, it picked up the tonality of the red brick. So, well, the number of materials that we could have chosen, but 
we came quite quickly. We looked at cladding it in timber. We looked at cladding it in, 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 other, in other metals. There was a zinc option at one stage. Um, and we came to the conclusion quite quickly with the client that the core 10 was the right solution. And we, even though the building, the Malthouse building is only locally listed, we still had to work quite closely with Historic England because it's in a conservation area. The conservation officer was very active in the in these discussions. So they and and you know we we made sure the client was happy with the options that we were proposing, and then we went and spoke to the planners in Historic England, and they they loved. We 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 had a great planning team um, in Canterbury, and they loved the idea of the core ten. So it was an easy. It was quite easy actually. Um, there were a few wobbles along the way when people, as I say, when people started seeing it going up on site and were worried about how it would weather. There was a concern from a couple of, of people on the governing body about staining, mm -hmm. which is why I mentioned the little gutter that stops the water from getting any, you know, which takes the water away from the, the concrete panels. Quite often, one of the problems with core 10 is that it does stain other materials. So we, we had, we were sort of pushing against an open door really. Um, and when, because the client was convinced, our client was convinced, and we then were able to convince the planners, Historic England, the conservation officer. Um, and when anybody raised a concern, um, it was quite easy to, to address because we were all so convinced it was the right solution. I guess that's one of the great things about the repeat client and being able to build that relationship, that there is a, a level of trust there, that they're obviously prepared to be guided by you. I think we're going to be joined by your colleague and uh, fellow director, uh, Giovanni Bonfanti. Hi. Fantastic. There we go. More the merrier. Right. Well, we've got a number of questions coming in. So let's see. We've got here, starting with, it's quite a, a good place to start, I think, a question from Francis. Why do you think that courtyards are not used as often in the UK? They seem to work brilliantly here. I would agree with that. Interesting point. Whew. Well, they're used quite a lot in places like Oxford and Cambridge, I suppose, which is where the typology started. Maybe um, she's thinking of the residential. They are generally much bigger, you know, and we were just actually, Giovanni and I were just looking at this for a competition we're doing at the moment, and the, the size of the courtyards in your average kind of Oxbridge College are usually, I don't know, probably a lot bigger, uh, four or five times the size at, as a minimum of what we've got in, in Canterbury. I think we were, we were just convinced by, why did other people not use it? Um, good question. We try and use courtyards wherever we can. Um, they, they're very good at protecting people from the, the weather, the wind, um, uh, creating this intimacy. Um, we've, we've done it quite a lot in our Buddhist retreat um, at, at, uh, in Suffolk. It's in a very kind of exposed, windy site, and we've used courtyards there to great effect to create this sense of um, intimacy, privacy, protection. Uh, again, another a, a project we did at Newnham College uh, in, in Cambridge, we used courtyards. So I, I'm, I'm very convinced about courtyards as a typology. Um, and it's widely used in Milan, where I come from. So this is the idea of the Palazzo, Milan Palazzo. Yeah. Put it in Canterbury, it was quite a start. Absolutely. And it clearly works extremely well in this setting. Um, I've got a question here from Barry. Um, and this is a specific question, but I think it's probably an opportunity to expand a bit more on the sort of environmental criteria of the project. He's, he asked, was this a Brienne rated project? Yes. And, and rating? It, we both think it was excellent. I'm pretty sure it was. Um, we should have double checked, but I'm pretty sure, I mean, I'm pretty sure it was excellent. So let's just say excellent, because that was... <laughs> Um, we're both. I don't remember. We're both it. sure it was excellent. So sorry to be vague. I know it's a very important point, but okay. uh, I don't have the stat sheet in front of me. But it's uh, this might be an even trickier one then. So if you don't know the answer, that's fine. I've got plenty more, but it's related. John, the first question we received actually from John was, "What was the water treatment equipment used for these two sites?" Gosh, now this really is a tough one. <laughs> no idea, to be honest. Not to worry. I think there's a couple more questions more about the kind of touch and feel of the place. I think this is an interesting one around moving on again from this idea of the choice of materials. I mean, it's not really from, but there is a evacuation tank on the sap, uh, which was a drainage issue because there's a there's a, uh, a, sewer. a sewer that runs directly under our site, and so we, we there was quite a lot of it was quite tricky. It was obviously all the structure had to cross you know straddle the sewer, so 
there, and we ended up with having to attenuate water because of the the uh, on the site. So, not specifically water treatment, but there were quite a lot of tricky drainage and water issues relating to the site. Perhaps John was in the know about that. Um, well, there's an incredibly high water table, so you know uh, uh, the river. Um, Often floods, so it's uh, it, it is it is an issue. Although this is not particularly flood sensitive, the site that we're talking about today. Okay, um, Esther has asked, uh, what deters you from the use of carpet in dormitories, which is an interesting one. Uh, A choice. Uh, I mean, I suppose to be honest, both I come from Africa, Giovanni comes from Italy. The idea of using carpets in bedrooms is fairly sort of weird to both of us. <laughs> I've also. I mean, one of my first experiences of, of going into a, a student room that had been had, had been vacated by the student was the, the domestic bursar in that particular environment showing me an upside down pizza on underneath a pile of clothes. And the pizza had literally welded itself into the carpet. So there was no way that you could ever, you know, you could probably never even clean it. Um, and, and I think that I, I think the, the, the longevity, really, the idea that you, you put down a carpet tiled floor and you just take up a tile and, and replace it if it gets damaged is just very short term thinking. And we, the, this client went along with our proposal that we use a material that could be could last for a long, long time. And they it's one of the things that everybody notices about the building. They notice them and they love the timber floors and they love the fact that it's not carpet. And the other thing was there were students coming from India, from China, from Mexico, from all over the world. And to be honest, they think putting carpets in bedrooms is pretty weird too, a lot of people. So, you know, we, we decided just not to be too English about it and just to be brave and go for the um, go for a, a warm, natural material and not... Fantastic. Go. You've sold me completely. All carpets will be ripped out. Um, <laughs> revolting things. <laughs> Right, thank you very much. We'll be hearing from Cindy and Girardi again a bit later. But now we're going to turn to Carol Patterson, our next guest from OMA. And she's going to be talking about the brand new School of Science and Sport at Brighton College. It's opened in January 2020, perhaps not the best time for schools to be opening. Um, <laughs> OMA's design incorporated 18 university standard laboratories, breakout spaces for research, a 25 metre pool, a strength and conditioning suite and a rooftop running trap over a double height sports hall. Well, that's the kind of equipment I would love to have had at school. I'd be fantastic to hear about it. So over to you, Carol, thank you. Thank you, Tracy. Um, I really actually like hearing, I like hearing these two projects together. There's a there's a, a lot of commonality and a lot of differences, um, but commonality for sure, we are European, I'm American, we don't like carpet either. <laughs> we try to not use it. It's a very British phenomenon. Um, anyway, I'm gonna show you uh, Brighton College, which um, as Tracy said, we finished just before the school closed um, for the first lockdown. So it, it hasn't properly been occupied in a proper way by students until actually, until this term really. Um, so it's on, it's, Brighton College is located in the um, Eastern portion of Brighton, the, the, um, the Brighton Pavilion is just to the left of the screen, but it's not very far from, from the beach. Um, and it's actually an historic campus. Um, it was the, the bottom half, I think I learned from Cindy that the cursor doesn't show up. So the bottom half here um, was designed by um, uh, Sir, Gil Sir Gilbert Scott in neo-Gothic style. Um, you'll be familiar maybe with Battersea Power Station. Um, there are quite a lot of other famous projects. So it had a very kind of hot Harry Potter-esque feel, feel to it, to us as, as foreigners. Um, the main elevation on Eastern Road was by Sir Thomas Jackson, who's a disciple of um, Sir Gilbert Scott. Um, but then there was actually at the at the northern half, so we're, we now changed the orientation around the sports fields. There was a long series of um, of a sort of seventies and eighties buildings that weren't weren't really well built. They were not had not been kept up, and the campus went on a plan to actually replace these eventually. The competition for us was areas four and five, and that was for a science building and a sports building and an atrium between the two of them that had a cafe that served the two buildings. But we mixed that up and decided that they should be combined into one building. And that was adjacent just as a sort of a view from that very muddy sports field in, in quite active use. So sports, sciences, and a bit of parking. 
Um, and then, as I said, we, we decided to combine those two, um, partly because that's something that we like to do, and secondly, because we believe that um, that sciences and sports actually have an interrelationship, whereas as sports and the body is actually a, a science. Um, and also, it'd be good to um, have a place where students, sort of the nerds and the, and the jocks, could actually maybe interact a bit more. So the um, project is actually uh, sort of along that field with the sports um, accommodation at the sports level. And they're very big spaces. There's a big gymnasium, a big swimming pool. These have to be um, column free. Their width and their heights are predetermined by the Sports England um, regulations for national play. And then the sciences bridge above the sports. So you can see that in a zoom in here. Um, and then there was some inspiration from the, um, this is probably a, a better sketch, um, the, the kind of the terrace housing that's opposite the building. I mean, it's quite a long building, so we wanted to break that up. Um, and as you come into Brighton, you'll notice rolling hills and these terrace houses that have very kind of um, evident party walls between them. There's quite a strong rhythm. Um, and then also some of the beach structures. So that actually became what we called the skeleton, which is the form of that um, of that bridge of the, of the sciences. And each laboratory is, is defined um, in the frame there. So that's a zoom in. Um, from building day. So that's actually what was there in the in the old days. There was the sports hall, um, I think very typical in Britain. At least that's what our client told us is that most sports halls are just um, big rooms with a bit of clear story light. Um, he wanted all glass and had seen quite a few on the continent. Um, and an old um, sort of was partly used classroom building here. So that's actually then uh, last summer and the uh, winter of the opening. Um, and, and one of the main ideas is as, as we mix these two different uses together was that there is circulation that brings you through and to both of them. So there's an interaction between these, these two um, uh, disciplines, even if you're actually not participating in one or the other. So the yellow is, is for the sports. If, you, if you're a participant in sports, you come in at the lower level, which we called campus level. Um, there are lots of dressing rooms here, and then you then you go directly into your um, either either the sports hall or the pool or the sport or the field um, or sciences. You come up this bridge here, and then you move up. There's quite a grand, um, wide open staircase um, that brings you up through and through the labs, and actually continues up to the top and to the roof, which is occupiable. And again, this is kind of all viewing platform um, for the sports that takes place in the field adjacent. Um, so you can see that sort of in 3D. And I'm just going to quickly take you through the, through the levels. So this is the um, what we call the field level. So this is um, coplanar with the sports field, which brings you up. We bring you up from the campus level, up this bridge, onto a, um, a viewing terrace and a cafe terrace into a cafe that's um, shared for both the aerobics and the um, uh, weight room. Then there's actually a lot, we bring you up slightly higher, so it's a few meters above the um, sports fields, but that also gives us light down into the swimming pool. Um, and then the sports hall then is actually completely openable to the, to the playing fields. And these are a few views then. So you can see, obviously, there's always a view. There's an emphasis to look inward at the campus. I mean, that's partly because the campus is very lovely. It's very sort of oldie worldy. Um, actually, the street behind us has an, an industrial estate, a bingo parlor, and a couple of small houses. So, so especially our client um, didn't want to show parents around. They want them looking into the field and not out at the neighbors, um, nor do we want the neighbors to be overlooked. Um, so then you can see where you do get these kind of level changes where you can see down to the pool and up and up into the aerobics room and then out to the field below. And that's basically these, these circulation spaces that, that change levels as you move through. And that's actually a reflection where that's that staircase. The swimming pool is below us, and that's a reflection to the sports field behind us. And the sports hall, again, accommodates lots and lots of different sports. Um, you can see it here. They're all painted on lines. But that actually, the height and the width, as I said, was um, prescribed by National Sports England. That's also why it's located at the, at the furthest bit of the, um, of the building. That actually prescribed the width of the building. 
So this is the level below. Again, as you come in through this, the sports entry, there are changing rooms, which actually then have direct access to the field. There are wet changing rooms, which have direct access to the pool. And there are uh, dry changing rooms, which then you move up the staircase and up to the um, sports hall above. So these are just some views. Again, we, we tried to open up kind of double height atrium spaces, so there's always you know connectivity between between activities. And then that's where you can see the, the step up, the clear story there. And then there's a sort of an intermediate level. This is the start of what we call the science bridge. It actually goes up slowly. These um, there are four laboratories that go up uh, uh, a slow stair against the adjacent um, also large wide stair. Very, very wide corridors, and that's just to allow space for circulation, space for breakout um, activities to happen within the, the intermediate spaces, um, within the, the more kind of regular lab layouts. Um, this is before COVID, actually, um, and so we were happy to have nice wide staircases, um, but the breakout spaces were actually not occupied for the last two years, so it would be nice to go back and see them, see them with students actually sitting together. But you can then see how these, this big wide staircase takes you up through the building. And then again, how the science laboratories generally are oriented to look over the sports field and the playing fields. So you can see that there. And then the, the upper level really is um, primarily laboratories. Again, because the client wanted to have the majority of them looking over the sports field, they're, they're oriented where they have, have a sort of a long view to the sports fields. Um, at this elevation, and they get, they get so they get then turned around. And there, there are less of them alongside where we have the industrial state over here. So that's just a view at the top, looking down that science bridge. Typical laboratory. And then the roof, because it's a nice big open space, um, we wanted to put that in use. That wasn't in the brief, um, but we have a portion of it. Um, is occupiable that's actually just um it's artificial grass um, just for maintenance reasons um and then this is all um sedum roof with a running track that goes along the length of it um so you can see that there uh, these are vents which i'll talk about in a minute um the running track um so these are the facades um I think the only kind of real real trick to that is uh, again i talked about the kind of emphasis on the on the um definition of the laboratories on the field side, and then this is the Sutherland Road side, and um, we use quite a bit of um, channel glass or reglet to give privacy, A, to not actually look out over the industrial state, and B, um, to not look over the um, over the, the few houses that are here, but also so that the clients, um, the students weren't being um, really viewed from the outside as well. So most of these is actually channel glass with a few um, like discrete windows um, and a greenhouse here. You can see that's from the streets. That's the greenhouse there. Again, so it is mostly um, translucent from that facade. And then um, well, just one story that we <laughs> like to tell is that in the competition, our clients said, actually, realize you foreigners don't know cricket. Um, this is the cricket pitch. This is actually a really vulnerable zone. If you lob your um, cricket ball, if you hit it and it goes this way, the client took me to Lord to show me how the ball sometimes goes that way. Um, it's going to come straight at your at your building. What are you going to do? <laughs> so um, we have all this glass. So we actually had this very elaborate systems proposed of cricket of nets that would kind of either be put up temporarily or they'd actually have this whole davit system that would hang them from the building. It was neither um, simple nor inexpensive. Um, and when we actually had our first just sample of glass to go view, um, our engineer said, that thing is thick. That's not going to break. We actually took it to the site. We got a cr cricket ball pitcher, you know, automatic thing, shucked a lot of balls at it. It didn't break. Um, and the client said, I'm willing to take the risk. If it does break, we'll have to replace it. But let's not go to this elaborate uh, way of, of catching the occasional fly ball or whatever you call it, cricket. Um, so that's a view of then of the of the gymnasium that when this is before um, during construction. So there's a lot of junk out here rather than just the nice green. Um, and then we have it, the whole building is naturally ventilated, but it's done in a in a subtle way where it's not um, an obvious um, openable window. 
um, in the major major in and out is through the greenhouse, which is just open up your doors, and then there's extract um, non non mechanical ventilation um, through the facades at the ends. Uh, so that's the greenhouse, just big open doors on the outside and the inside, which brings in fresh air. And then this is actually all um, mesh behind, and it's an openable, openable windows um, behind, just within the corridor. You open up a big sliding door, and it's just fresh air. But then within each classroom, um, uh, I don't know if you can see the bottom of the slide. It's cut a little bit with the thing. But we have um, at the facade are two... Um, the frame of the of the skeleton has a ventilation within that frame and it's a little openable door within the classroom and then there's a natural vent all of the classrooms but two have a natural vent um, within the depth of their of their room um, so you can see here's a detail here where this is the little door that opens up um, and natural ventilation comes through a grill which is on the um, bottom, I don't know if you can see it there, the bottom of the of the detail, um, and then it comes up and through and into the classroom, which of course has to be acoustically separated classroom to classroom, and then so it's quite subtly tucked away behind the teaching walls there on the left and the right, and then you can look if you look carefully here at the edges of the frame, the sort of second depth of the edge of the frame um, going in is a grill. So that, that maintain that kind of clean facade. And here's a view from the roof. And then this is as we said that, that it does it, that science bridge steps up again. So the whole circulation loop brings you up to the top. Um, and these are used as viewing decks over the sports field um, for sports days for parents and other pupils. And I think that's my last slide. Sorry, I went maybe too quickly. I have a tendency to do that. <laughs> No, it's fantastic. Thank you. You covered a lot of ground in a small amount of time. I mean, what a dynamic and exciting project. I mean, I, I love this idea of you took two parts of the, the brief and put them together, the sort of the brain and the brawn coming together. Um, I wonder how many sporty types or nerds lives <laughs> transformed by that juxtaposition. Um, I also think it's very refreshing to, unfortunately, the black the blank box is a phenomenon in the UK for sports halls and schools, and it's great to challenge that. But really what I love is the way that the thinking about the teaching spaces and the, the shaking those up a bit too and thinking about the opportunities for informal spaces to learn and the outside spaces. And this is stuff that's being talked about a lot in higher education, but I think in schools it's still quite difficult to kind of break away from the accepted models. And it's really refreshing to see. Now we've got so many great questions coming in and not that much time, so I'm not going to ask one of my own questions. I'm going to jump to one of the questions in the chat. Um, Janet asked, and I think this is a really interesting because it's so much about roots, this building. How does the root of a visitor and a student compare to each other in the building? How does it differ, I guess? Um, it doesn't really. Um, you know, it, so visitors, because it's a, it's a private school, um, the visitors are few and far between. So, so it's really all just for the use of um, uh, occupiers of the campus. I mean, if you have a visitor, you have to go through a whole process um, and you would only probably be a prospective parent that's being shown around. Um, or So I think the headmaster, we intended the whole roof to be used by all the students in the building to go up there all the time. I think the headmaster saw it as a great opportunity for having um, fundraisers. <laughs> so I do believe it's not always open to the students, unfortunately. I, I wish it was. Um, so I think it actually is controlled by, by the school um, more than just letting everyone go there all the time. OK, great. Um, and I've got a question here from Joe Bacon. Were the okay. standards for vibration between the floors and acoustics also set for Sports England, the client, or did that come about through the brief development? Um, it, probably through brief development, the client, it, not in Sports England, and not that we came across, um, the client, not necessarily either. We were concerned about it, particularly having a running track on the roof and how much vibration there would be from potential marching and vibration over sports labs. And it's a long, slightly springy building. Um, it was designed actually as a CLT building. Um, but uh, it was design build and that went kind of on the first minute that the contractor came on board. Um, so we did have to do a lot of, um, well, we pushed doing a lot of acoustic studies, um, especially for vibration of, of, that, of that running track. And it is all on, um, on, um, on kind of rubber spacers, the entire thing. Um, I, and, and actually, the, I think the sports hall, we had it open to the 
hallway corridors above and we did have to close that off for just for noise levels because you knew it would be quite quite loud um but um it really came from brief development i'd say yeah okay great um i've got a question here from jake yes jake he says he loves this project and fascinating building <laughs> looking back now is there anything you would have changed or improved with the project um no i actually don't think we have too many regrets i think partly partly because it was design build you know in our in our view a lot of things even though we drew them and they were bought in the in the d and b purchase they still got lost mm -hmm. for the sake of time and um well time more than anything and i think the client might still be trying to get some of them back um you know earlier because we actually did two we did two competitions for this so the first one um, included an academic building and we we actually put all of three of those together and the building was really large um and the client came back and said that we're going to split it into two competitions put the academic somewhere else and let's just do science and sports here so i think i think we kind of had that second round um where we were able to improve on things between the first and the second um and i wouldn't say i you know i've taken people around the building not so long ago but i've actually never been when it's been just active with students because the first two years was sort of part-time mm -hmm. and they always take people around when when it's closed for for half term and so i i actually love to see it with students in it and talk to them <laughs> no no it works and what doesn't but i don't i haven't had that yeah that's a real shame because in a way that's the best feedback loop yeah, isn't it? it's exactly. also wonderful about working in education projects is you do actually get to see it in action yeah. i hope you get that opportunity but i think perhaps maybe we should invite cindy and giovanni back because i've got a couple of questions here that arguably uh, should go to, obviously there's a lot of commonality across these projects in terms of education sector but also um the client and one of the questions that um we've been asked from francis is could you both comment on the experience of working for an educational institution as client? Um, I'll go first, I, just, I think oh, Cindy has a much, um, I, I'm again, also very jealous of your your longevity with your clients. So I think that you might be able to comment on that in, in more in depth than, than myself. Um, for us, I think Brighton College is, is actually very, um, very, um, educated in being a client they've they've been ambitious for a number of years um they've hired a number of architects to do eric perry allies and morrison um to do um one-off uh, buildings um and then they go they like to go on tours of i think you know i can't tell you how many buildings of ours they looked at um that was more to choose their materials which is not the way to work with a client um and you know a whole series of theaters for the next project but um so, so actually for us it was great but they were an educated client so i'm not sure um how maybe that compares to cindy's experience and cindy how about you and your dream client down at king's well, I, i'm very envious of of the experience of working with brighton because they um as you know as carol's saying they are a very experienced client and they've won client of the year and i think if not i mean maybe twice at least once yeah, yeah. And um, because they, they go out of their way to, you know, they, they make a big effort to commission great architects to do great buildings. And, and that's, you know, that's a particular type of client. We have, you know, we're, I, I say with a, a, big, a big portion of our work is in education. Um, we like working with all kinds of clients. We, we work with small, big um, universities, you know, kindergartens. Um, and and we, what I think we love the most is, well, clients with vision and clients that are sort of looking quite far ahead and thinking about master planning and thinking about, you know, the future, thinking about sustainability, about accessibility, about all of these crucial issues um, about, you know, and, and I, I suppose what we really enjoy is the, is the consultation and working with the, the students and the staff and the end users um, and bringing that all into the design and um, and we do that a lot. Um, and yeah, we. I think that the, it gives, the other thing I like about working in, with education clients is that they give, it gives you a big variety of different types of projects. So, you know, sometimes it's a sports building, sometimes it's an art building, sometimes it's a general teaching building, sometimes it's on the back edge of a pavement in, a, in an urban environment, sometimes it's in a green field, sometimes it's in a, massively listed, you know, grade one, you know, World Heritage Site 
kind of site and other times it's, that's not so important. So it gives you this kind of real breadth of experience across all kinds of, of site contexts and building contexts that I'm not sure many other sectors give you. So uh, does that, hopefully that answers the question. Yeah, absolutely. Let's add, add that there is also an element of complexity because it's a multi-head client. You always have to deal with uh, a lot of uh, different personality in different pools. So it's about making a synthesis between a lot of different ideas. <laughs> yeah, a lot of conflicting um, interests sometimes as well, particularly if you're also doing it DMB, which adds to the complexity of it. <laughs> um, so another question from the audience. If um, we are slightly running over, but as you will all know, we started late due to some technical problems. So hopefully people can bear with us for another couple of minutes. We've got a question from Ola Samba, who says, loved both presentations. Did either of you create any of your own perspectives to serve as a future catalogue or toolkit for future projects? Hmm. Um, Cindy, why don't you carry on? Uh, we'll uh, we, did, we, we did a number of, we did lots and lots of different kinds of um, visualizations because of, you know, as, as, as Giovanni was saying, we, you know, we, we deal with this kind of multi-headed community when we're delivering these projects. So all of the images that, uh, the ones towards the end of my presentation that I showed, we produced all of those in-house. Some of the um, more CGI type images, we worked with a, an, a CGI studio called Studio Archetype. Um, and there's, they think there are three CGI's that we've used in all the kind of um, planning applications that were done by Archetype and the rest were all done by us. Um, but we generally work with a range of different kinds of visualizations from sketches to study models to CGI's. Um, and this particular client is quite like CGI, so they commission them um, for all their projects, usually only three or four. Um, and we don't really have the capacity to do those in-house. So we, we the, for the very high res ones, we generally tend to go to an, an external studio. Fantastic. And Carol, did you have any? Um, um, I mean, it's not not necessarily for. I mean, I think I think every time you do a project, you save save things for the future, and you might um, recycle um, as you move through. I mean, in some ways, you could say this project is very for us. It's kind of an old school of a project where it has the kind of classic circulation loop that shares. I mean, we've done that many times. Um, uh, so I think you're always kind of referencing yourself, but also trying to move through and, and you may come, come back to things. Um, and if we, um, I think, yeah, I think it's just, and again, I, I didn't show any of the before afters, but I think we similarly have, you know, here's the rendering and I'd probably just point out to you all the things that we lost in either D and B or the client actually saw another building of ours and liked the gray stuff better than the colored stuff, which I think is a shame. I think it's not enough color in that project. Um, but, um, so that's not a very clear answer, but I think, it's I right. think it's it, right. it, it, they'll save them specifically, but always in the back of your head. Yeah. Okay. I've got a last question. I must say this was one I wanted to ask. So I'm very pleased that uh, Janet has asked this one. Um, they're both pretty bold projects in fairly conservative settings. Um, how has the local community, the residents and students reacted to both projects, starting with you, Carol? I, as I said, I don't know as much as I'd like to. I, I, the students, I mean, from what I, the few that I've been able to say, do you like it? Or someone says, my child goes there. I'm like, what do they think? And they're like, oh, they love it. <laughs> so I don't, I have I don't, residents, like free planning and so on. Um, so planning, we actually had some very local residents. The small houses that the building overlooks um, were obviously displeased because they were going to lose some of that. They actually, you know, but honestly, they're... It, it, we, and there's an apartment building at the top that said, oh, we're going to have to look at this horrible thing. I'm like, actually, we're giving this giant green vegetated mm. roof to look over as opposed to a smattering of 1980s roofs that are falling apart. So, um, and the local residents who were against it really wanted to be able to use the swimming pool, which apparently they could about 40 years ago, which you can't because of child protection rules anymore. Um, so it was more that kind of thing. But, but Heritage was actually um, incredibly supportive. I think because we had this even though it's very bold on the campus, we had a very industrial state across the way. Um, we had unanimous planning consent. Um, it was BREAM excellent, uh, which is required by Brighton Brighton um, Council. Um, so, I, you know, it, it was generally positive with a few kind of neighbors who were 
you know, and how about the doing a lot of construction, so they kind of, oh, no, another one, I, I think is maybe more the, more the attitude. Disturbing, <laughs> sure. And how about the Canterbury residents? Uh, how did they feel, Cindy? Uh, well, we, we did three uh, public consultations on site. Uh, there were some ecological concerns, so we, we did a lot of extra work where there were slow worms and things on the site. So there, we did a lot of extra work um, showing to, to explain how the biodiversity and the greenness of the site would be improved. So people were very happy about that. Um, the people, the community come in and you, and, you know, the, the, the whole community of Canterbury and around come in to use the theatre. When on theatre evenings, they have the courtyard of the International College open and they, everyone uses the kind of external piazza. So it, it's very much used by the, by the local community. And um, so far, so good. Everybody seems to really have embraced it and welcomed it. And but I, think, I think they were well, you know, they, they knew what to expect. Uh, they also come in to use the fencing center and the tennis courts. So I think there's, um, there's been a big effort on the part of the client to make sure that the community felt welcome and that they knew what was coming um, and in fact, in, in, the, in, the, in the planning uh, committee meeting, which was also a unanimous decision, they, I, I spent quite a lot of my, whatever, how many minutes you allocated, um, explaining what the King's School do for the local community, because, you know, it's quite, quite impressive. So I think, I think it was, an, I don't know, it was an easy sell to the local community, really. Even though we Sorry, good morning. No, I just said that even though we were at the back of private garden, yeah, fortunately, very long, private very garden, long private gardens, and yeah. uh, and we were basically replacing a, a massive car park with uh, uh, noise and things. So I think they they got back something better. Yeah. But I remember when we were on site and the buildings would start to grow. There was a big yeah. sign on one of the shed at the back on the roof. They wrote, they wrote, "We want back our privacy." <laughs> But it was <laughs> a bit late. It was a bit late. <laughs> Fantastic. Okay, well, that's it for today. Many thanks to our special guests, Cindy and Giovanni from Wilson Cohen and Carol from OMA for fantastic presentations. I'm sure you've all thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, so thank you very much, everybody, particularly to our guests and to audience and to all the fantastic questions. It's been lovely to do this again. And goodbye. <laughs>